myself, Dr. Palani Raman, a practicing pediatrician from Tindivanam, Tamil Nadu. Today's topic for discussion is epistaxis. What is epistaxis? Epistaxis is otherwise called nosebleeds in layperson's terms. It is a common problem one encounters in practice which is scary and alarming to the parents. But most often in the children, it is a benign condition and self-limiting condition. Whereas with respect to adults, it can be serious. The conditions ranging from hypertension <coughs> to carcinoma. In children, what is the common age group you come across the epistaxis? Epidemiologically, it has been found. It is very common in the school-going child, followed by preschool child, but very rare in infancy. Okay, a patient is coming to me with epistaxis. What will I do? The first and foremost step is, I like to know whether the patient is coming with bleeding still or the bleeding has stopped. Then I take measures to stop the bleeding at first. Then my important consideration is ABC or vitals. Is the patient stable? After knowing that ABC is fine and vitals are stable, then I like to know the child is sick or not. Why? Because sometimes systemic like illness like dengue with the history of fever of 3 to 4 days followed by they can come with the bleeding and it can be a dengue or a serious systemic illness like even malignancy. So only I like to see whether the child is sick or not. After stabilizing the patient or knowing that the child is stable as well as the child is not sick, my next clinical approach would be like this. Is the onset sudden? Most of the time the sudden onset will be a trauma or it is spontaneous or induced. Commonly in children, it is an induced origin due to no speaking, repeated no speaking or sometimes in a dry weather, powerful blowing of the nose can also produce epistaxis. If it is a spontaneous bleed, it can be a bleeding diathesis. Then I like to know the duration. It will be a, mostly it will be a very short duration of few minutes before coming to your clinic, it would have been stopped. Very rarely it will be a prolonged bleeding. Whenever it is a prolonged, you should suspect systemic bleeding disorders. Then I like to know, is it a unilateral or bilateral? If it is bilateral, only two causes. It can be a blunt trauma or a systemic causes. If it is a unilateral, I like to know whether history of any foreign body or history of any foul smelling nasal discharge. We all know foul smelling unilateral nasal discharge with bleeding is foreign body unless proved otherwise. Then I like to know history of any multiple side bleeding or only the bleeding in the nose. If it is a multiple side bleeding, mostly I am in going in favor of bleeding disorders or a systemic disorders. Then, is this the first time or history of recurrence in the past? Recurrent spontaneous bleeding can be a bleeding disorder or sometimes recurrent nose picking can be there which can be the cause for the bleeding disorder. Also in an adolescent, I mainly ask for any history of progressive nasal obstruction was there before the onset of bleeding. Why? Because it could have been a potentially a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. And last but not the least, family history is very important. Why? Because when there is a family history of bleeding, mostly we are dealing with a bleeding disorder. So by 
the above seven to eight questions, I can easily delineate what could be the cost in 80 to 85 percent of the cases. Then I look at the examination. How I am going to examine? In a case of adult, mainly with the nasal speculum, or in a children, the otoscopic nasal specula with a large size otoscopic specula, you can clearly examine. First and foremost, I want to know the anatomy of the site of the bleeding. Most of the time, it is in the antero-inferior part of the nasal septum, which is otherwise known as the littles area, where the Kessel box plexus is there, and it is nothing but anastomosis of both the interior carotid and external carotid vessels. They are anastomosing here, and the unique feature is it is fragile. Why? Because there is the least connective tissue support in that region. That is the reason it commonly bleeds. When you examine, you can confirm the site of bleeding. Then also you see the mucosal integrity or underlying allergic rhinitis or underlying infective rhinitis or any vascular malformation in the form of telangiectasia, mainly in case of some congenital conditions can present with telangiectasia or any mass is there on examination or a foreign body is there on an examination. Finally, even a deviated nasal septum can produce a one side dryness and produce repeated bleeding. Apart from local examination, I mainly look for the pallor, petechiae purpurae and mainly any hepatosplenomegaly anything or not to rule out the systemic illness like malignancy or a bleeding disorders. So after history and clinical examination, most of the time I can easily come to narrow down the diagnosis. Most of the time in children, mostly it is a local cause and a self-limiting cause. Whereas in adults, I forgot to tell the mainly the BP, measurement of BP is very important. Sometimes the BP, very severe BP can be the inciting cause or it can be the cause for the prolonged bleeding. Then when shall I investigate? Whether I should investigate all these patients? I try to investigate only when the following red flags are present. If the bleeding is prolonged and it is not stopped, and in spite of my measures, first aid measures, the bleeding is not stopped. Number one. Number two, massive bleed. Number three, recurrent bleed. Number four, family history of bleed. And recurrent spontaneous bleed. All these things indicates mostly I am dealing with a systemic disorder and any constitutional symptoms are there or not. What are the investigations? The first and foremost is the CBC and peripheral smear which gives a clue about the platelet disorders. Platelet disorders can be in the form of thrombocytopenia that is a reduction in number or reduction in the quality or reduction in the function. Peripheral smear gives a lot of clue about the platelet function disorders. If there are no clumps you see all the platelets in the fingertip smear, everything separated and not in clumps, it indicates mostly there is an aggregation disorder. Or if the platelets are very giant, it indicates bernard shawley syndrome. Or if it is a large platelets, few and large, it can be a ITP. As well as I like the severity of the anemia also in the CBC. Then I look at the PT and APTT to rule out the coagulopathies. After CBC, peripheral smear, PT and PTT, still it can be a bleeding disorder like Von Willebrand's disease. Why? Because Von Willebrand disease, everything can be normal, still you have to specifically investigate and epistaxis can be the presenting manifestation of Von Willebrand disease. Apart from this, Sometimes if I feel there is something, a metallic foreign body like thing, anything is there in the nose, I specifically ask for lateral x-ray of the nose. 
if I suspect a mass, specifically I specifically ask for contrast CT. So this much is the most of the investigations are covered. After history, examination and investigation, your diagnosis is narrowed. Depending on the man diagnosis, your management differs. As I have already told, most of the time it is simple and local cause. When they come with bleeding, the first aid measure is mainly is pinching the nose beyond the nasal bone for a period of 5 to 10 minutes without intermittent relaxation in a Hippocratic position that is forward bending of the child, mainly the neck as well as the forward bending will definitely stop the bleeding in most of the conditions. If it is not stopping, again try for a prolonged period of 30 minutes pressure without relaxation. In spite of this, if the bleeding is not stopping, refer to a pediatric ENT surgeon for aggressive local measures like nasal packing or nasal balloon tamponade like thing and many procedures are there which are mainly done by the ENT surgeons to stop the bleed. After managing the first aid part as well as the specific part, is there any preventive measures to say to the patient? Definitely yes. If they come with a repeated bleeding with repeated nose picking, mainly we have to change the patient's attitude or child's attitude, explain the parents to change the behavior of the child and what are the methods to change the behavior of the child like distraction etc. Sometimes in extreme climatic conditions in like in North India, like in Delhi or in Kashmir where extremes of temperatures are there, extreme winter or extreme summer, with the recurrent bleed you can prevent the nasal drying and bleeding and you can, mainly with the help of saline nasal sprays. Sometimes rarely said in the literature, recurrent epistaxis can be due to staphylococcal carriage with recurrent pharyngitis in the patient. When there is history of recurrent pharyngitis and recurrent bleeds, always try to apply nasal mepuration for a period of three weeks because sometimes staphylococcal carriage is known to cause irritation and bleeding and this nasal mepuration for three weeks will settle the issue. These are the preventive methods I have told. After knowing all this from the epidemiology to the clinical approach and the evaluation and the management prevention, I hope you the viewers will be able to approach the patient with epistaxis confidently in your clinic. Thank you very much.